It is time for questions to the Executive Office, and I call Dolores Kelly to ask the first question. Ms Kelly. Question one, Minister. <clears throat> <clears throat> Housing has been identified as a key priority within the programme for government draft outcomes framework published for consultation. The provision of suitable housing for everyone features uh, prominently in three of the nine wellbeing outcomes, reflecting the importance that the executive attaches to the matter. The public consultation, which commenced on the 25th of January, is an important first step in the development process for the new programme. The consultation closes later today, and the process of, an a of analysing the comments and the views expressed by stakeholders and respondents to the consultation will commence very shortly. The aim is to have an agreed outcomes framework informed by the consultation ready around the end of April, and then a more complete programme incorporating an agreed budget linked to policies and programmes brought forward for Assembly consideration by the summer recess. Supplementary, Dolores Kelly. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Joint First Minister for her response and uh, indeed for her acknowledgement that uh, housing is uh, uh, related to uh, good well-being and good health. But uh, uh, there has been an ongoing issue about land banking, and I just wonder, then, Minister, moving forward, following these consultations, are, are there any plans to take any actions against those who continue to land bank, particularly in around also public housing? as well as uh, ensuring that there will be a sufficient budget allocation uh, going some way to meet some of the need. I thank the member for um, her question and, and absolutely agree. I, mean, I welcome the fact that she's highlighting the fact that housing is such an important area for us to be focused on, whether that be on social housing, affordable rents, uh, repairs to the housing executive, housing executive properties. Um, I know that um, the Minister for Communities, Georgie Hargey, has also brought forward the biggest shake-up in public housing in 50 years, and that's something I know that um, the member would also welcome. So we look forward to that work being um, undertaken. But you're right in terms of land banking, there's a lot more to be done there, and that would be outside even the remit of just communities. There would need to be a number of departments involved. Um, there. What's, more, what's most important is that we provide housing um, for, for the public and that it's provided in the right locations, that people who live in rural areas have the same access to housing as you do um, elsewhere. So um, I'm more than happy to raise the issue of Land banking in particular, um, at executive, just to, to ensure that that's also factored into um, the considerations that are, are already underway. Call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you very much, Deputy First Minister. Um, Minister, as you've said, um, housing appears in three of the nine wellbeing outcomes. During the new decade, new approach, there was a specific agreement to have a housing outcome on its own because that will lead to um, many other options being opened, such as environment and so on. Can I just ask why the decision was taken then to, to keep dividing it up and not have a specific outcome? Can I thank the member um, again for her commentary. And, I, mean, I share uh, some of the concerns that you have raised, and actually the Communities Minister, the Housing Minister, has also raised that very point. And you are right. Um, we've, we've, I think what we have tried to do, and this is a draft format, so everybody has the chance to change and to input, so we welcome all the engagement that's happened to date, and there's been considerable engagement actually um, with the draft programme. We welcome that, but the, the purpose of the consultation is to try to get us uh, to a point where we actually are able to um, change things if we can. I would say, however, um, the draft programme, its current form, it doesn't seek to denigrate or downgrade the, the housing outcome because it is written large across three of the different areas, and actually in more detail than you would get in terms of a high-level aspiration. So hopefully, it's about a practical outworking of what we can do. Um, on housing, um, but uh, we've listened very carefully throughout the um, throughout the consultation, and I hope that, um, and I've no doubt, actually, there will be a strong lobby. We will have been received across uh, from many people in terms of this, and I'm very open to the conversation continuing. Well, Carl Nicholson. I'll get uh, Karen Collier, and I thank the Joint First Minister for her responses thus far, and indeed to Lord for tabling a very important question. Um, could. Uh, my question is um, if the Joint First Minister could detail the work being carried out to address decades of underinvestment in our housing programme. Gormagut. Uh, thanks again to the member for um, the question. And as I just sort of previously um, touched upon, uh, the Minister for Communities, Georgie Hargey, has already highlighted to all of the executive colleagues that the outcomes framework. Um, needs to be um, revised. That's her view as the Housing Minister, and, and as, as you would expect her to, to talk about. But I am also very pleased with the work which Minister Hargey um, has brought forward. Um, she has been very 
clear working through um, an ambitious uh, proposal to transform the housing system, what I've described as the biggest shake-up of public housing in 50 years, and that will include securing the future of the housing executive, ensuring that it can build homes where they're needed. The finance minister and communities ministers have also successfully worked together to end the housing executive's requirement to pay a corporation tax, and will also explore future investment opportunities, which will result in the housing executive's ability to maintain and repair its current stock, as well as building more homes. So, on behalf of the executive, Minister Hargey continues to make significant progress in this area, particularly around um, bringing forward measures to tackle homelessness. And she will provide a programme that will see new social and affordable homes being built where they are needed. And overall, we will see through the recent statement that um, she will make sure that our housing system works better for all those that need a home. Call Liz Kimmins. Can call it Kestia Doe. Question to you, please. Addressing issues arising from the end of the transition period has been a priority for us, um, with discussions taking place on a number of levels and with multiple partners and stakeholders. As an executive, we consider issues arising from the end of the transition period at our regular meetings on EU exit matters. In the run-up to and following the end of the transition period, we have engaged with the European Commission through our participation in the Joint Committee, which has now met on seven occasions and most recently on the 24th of February. We met with the European Commission's co-chairs uh, of the Joint Committee, that's uh, Michael Gove and Vice President, Pre Vice President Maros Sekovic, back on the 3rd of February. We and the junior ministers have also continued to engage with him and his colleagues, uh, with them and their colleagues primarily through the Exit Operations uh, Cabinet Committee, where we have taken the opportunity to highlight issues as they arise, including at a detailed or a dedicated discussion on the protocol which was held on the 7th of January. In addition, our officials hold weekly meetings with the Trader Support Service and their counterparts in the Irish Government to proactively ensure that any emerging issues are addressed as quickly as possible. We also continue to engage closely with stakeholders in our business community to ensure that their concerns are also understood. Throughout all of our engagement, we have taken every opportunity to highlight the need to resolve issues and to ensure that additional burdens and costs for our people and our businesses are minimised. I thank the Joint First Minister for her answer. Uh, First Minister, the recent breaches by the British Government of its legal obligations to implement the protocol will come as no surprise to the majority in this chamber, who were and remain opposed to Brexit, and who were acutely aware of the damage that it would do to our people and our economy. Does the Joint First Minister share my concern that the British Government's most recent solo run on the implementation of the protocol was reckless and unnecessary, and creates even more instability and uncertainty? Thanks, the member, um, for the question. I, I attended a meeting of the Joint Committee on the 24th of February with Michael Gove and uh, Maurice Sekovic, where both reaffirmed their support for the protocol and the need to work together to deal with the issues that have um, arisen. Yet, despite these commitments, and less than a week later, obviously the British Government went on to do the solo run and took unilateral action that has totally undermined the work of the Joint Committee and does risk that collision course with the European Union, where we again become the collateral damage. And certainly, in my own personal opinion, not the TEO opinion, but that was a calculated act of political bad faith. But I don't think it will come any, as any surprise to the member that the current instability and uncertainty is a direct consequence of Brexit, a Brexit that was rejected by a majority across our community and rejected by a majority across this House. Um, for those who champion Brexit, they need to own the economic consequences and the uncertainty that has flowed from it. And any threats to the implementation of the protocol which is our protection against the worst excesses of a hard Brexit, clearly risks future stability, growth and prosperity. So I think it's still a time for, cl for clarity, for um, stability. It's still a time for certainty and it's still a time to find solutions to the issues as and when they may arise. Call Christopher Stalford. Uh, Mr Speaker, throughout the Brexit process, the Deputy First Minister and other colleagues on this side of the House have been faithful cheerleaders for the European Commission. Given the disgraceful behaviour over the course of the last 24 hours, where well, the European Commission is now actively threatening vaccine supplies, not only for my constituents, but for the Deputy First Ministers, would she and the Remain parties in this chamber care to revise their fealty to the European Commission? I think, again, a, a personal uh, viewpoint uh, to the member would be that, um, thank goodness, we had people to look out for the interests of the Good Friday Agreement, and thank God we had 
an EU that stayed, that stayed firm for that. So we are where we are today. Let me be very clear in terms of vaccines. They shouldn't be a commodity. They shouldn't be traded. They should be given to those people who need them most. And we should be working together to try and make sure that's the case. So let me just make that uh, point very clearly. Well, Matthew O'Toole. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, Deputy First Minister, speaking of people revising their earlier position, like people on the other side of the House might want to uh, examine uh, data put out today by the UK Food and Drink Federation, which shows that UK exports of salmon to the EU were down 98 per cent, uh, beef down 91 per cent, cheese 85 per cent, pork 87 per cent. Uh, Deputy First Minister, given that agri-food is such an important part of our economy, and given that, sadly, British food producers are now at such an appalling disadvantage, thanks to the Brexit champion by those opposite, what are we doing to maximise the advantage presented by the protocol, which gives our farmers and food producers unfettered access to the EU market, which is clearly so important to farmers and food producers? Well, I thank the member for um, his question, and he's absolutely right in terms of we are where we are today, um, albeit that. Um, it wasn't the, the democratically expressed wishes of the people who live here. So I think that what we have to do is maximise the potential that we have and have an access to the EU market. What we need to do is look towards economic recovery in a post-COVID world, um, what that looks like um, with the new trading realities that now exist as a direct result of Brexit. So we have to work with local industry. We have to work with, in particular, the agri-food industry that you've uh, referred to. Uh, look towards work, what are the market opportunities, what are the opportunities, what are the challenges, what can we do to assist them, um, and we need to do all that we can because these, we are now faced with a post-Brexit era where there are many new trade and realities as a direct result of Brexit. Call Jim Allister. Uh, bearing in mind that it was new decade, new approach that brought the Deputy First Minister back to rule over us, could I ask her, in terms of its commitment to Northern Ireland's continuing to be an integral part of the United Kingdom internal market and its guarantee of unfettered access in terms of EU trade, does the Deputy First Minister and the office that she represents support the rigorous implementation of those pledges? Um, I think that over many, many decades, uh, you'll, you'll, the member will know rightly that every time that we have signed up to any political commitments, we have always honoured those commitments, and that remains our um, position. What we're dealing with in terms of Brexit um, it are the unfortunate trading realities in the post-Brexit world, and I think that um, those that champion Brexit, the member included, needs to shoulder some of the responsibility for the situation that many people find themselves in today. My rule of thumb has always been to ensure that we had continued north, south and east west trade, that we minimise disruption to businesses, that we minimise the costs and burdens that fall upon consumers and that we support our local business industry. That remains uh, the position today. I call her Leah Flynn. Question number three. With your permission, I will answer questions three and fourteen together. Uh, the Executive is focused on building a careful and ambitious plan for moving forward in 2021 and beyond. We reviewed the restrictions on the 16th of March and we agreed that in addition to a phased approach culminating in all school year groups being back to face-to-face -face learning from the 12th of April, there will also be modest relaxations in place from the 1st of April in relation to non-essential retail, click and collect, and numbers permitted outdoor gatherings and also in private gardens. From the 12th of April, further relaxations will be implemented in relation to the numbers permitted in private gardens, click and collect, outdoor sports training, as well as the stay at home message. And obviously, that's all subject to the executive ratification um, after Easter. Many parks and outdoor spaces have remained open, enabling people to take daily local exercise. By the end of the cautious first steps phase on the sports and leisure activities pathway, we hope to open all outdoor visitor attractions for visitors as well as outdoor sports facilities for training and organised group activities. It is important that we ensure that our society can reopen in a sustainable manner that reduces the risk of reintroducing, uh, reintroducing even restrictions in the future. Looking beyond the relaxation of restrictions, the Executive has started the process of developing a cohesive cross-departmental strategy which focuses on societal, economic and health recovery. And this will outline key interventions that will take account of current COVID-19 restrictions and also the medium to long-term outcomes that are envisaged in the draft programme for government. 
Thank you, and I thank the, the Joint First Minister for her response. Um, as we know, the pandemic has had a huge impact on many, many people, um, particularly the vulnerable, the lonely, um, the you know those in poverty and housing need. And women, in, in particular, have also been um, impacted quite badly, and we've seen the increased levels of unemployment and domestic violence. So, with all that in mind, does the, the Joint First Minister um, agree with me that addressing social inequalities and concerns should be at the core <coughs> to the executive's recovery strategy. Thank you. Thanks uh, again for the question. The, the pandemic has certainly highlighted high levels of poverty, inequality and disadvantage across our community. I am also particularly aware that the social, economic, social and economic impact of the pandemic has fallen hard on women, many of whom are in low-paid, precarious employment, while, may, while and many others have lost their jobs. The rise in domestic violence also and, and abuse has also been particularly alarming. I think as we step out of the restrictions, we too must develop more sustainable and strategic responses that at their core break the cycles of poverty, exclusion and inequality. In this context, the Minister for Communities will be bringing forward a plan for inclusive social recovery that will include tackling unemployment and delivering inclusive economic growth, protecting the vulnerable, including through delivering across government anti-poverty strategy, improving the supply of decent and affordable housing, working with local councils to support town and city centre recovery, recovery of our communities through support for organisations that um, support community development, recovery of our culture, arts and heritage sectors, and supporting a safe return to sport and physical activity. Addressing social inequalities and looking after the most vulnerable, the lonely, those in housing need, those in poverty, and families and workers in low incomes must be core to our recovery strategy. And I think the member would agree when I say that we owe it to all of the people in, in our society to make that happen. Call Pat Kettner. Call you. Um, could the minister provide an update on vaccine supply, and will we reach the targets as set out in the vaccination timetable? Uh, of course, that's the, the remit of the health minister. Um, but certainly, um, we are. You have saw commentary from the health department over the course of, of the past number of days in terms of um, concerns that they have. They may see a couple of weeks delay in terms of the rollout plan that was originally envisaged. So um, I'm hopeful that things continue to go as well as they have been in terms of the vaccination programme. And we only can hope that we can get to a point where we're able to get the maximum number of people vaccinated, and it allows us then, obviously, to. Uh, marry that with our pathway out of, uh, out of restrictions. Call Paula Bradshaw. Speaker, um, thank you, um, Deputy First Minister, for your answer so far. Um, I'm just wondering what consideration has been given to those members of staff who have been on furlough, whether they be in um, retail, business, um, restaurants, etc. You know, it's one thing earning a salary. But it's another thing we know that work is not just about the payment, it's also about the interaction and the sense of, uh, sense of worth. I'm just wondering, in your recovery strategy, how you're actually going to accommodate them to get back into the workplace. Thank you. I think you're right. I mean, it's, 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 even, it's the same consideration, actually, for all the children and young people returning to school today. So long without that interaction, so long not having the chance to engage with people and, and just you know, be our normal selves. So I think that uh, part of the recovery and the executive has, as I said, started this a conversation, a piece of work around you know, what it is that we need to focus on. And, and certainly there are needs of, of many people who have been impacted by the pandemic that need to be taken into account. You, you refer to one group in society, those people that have been furloughed, potentially those in the hospitality sector, uh, retail sector, all those people that have been furloughed for a year, the best part of a year. Then we also have to look at the situation facing our nurses right now and those who work in the health service. Who, um, you know, It is quite alarming to listen to some of the the, the real lived experience of those people working on the front line and dealing with this pandemic. And certainly I would be fearful for their mental health and wellbeing. And uh, just in the last number of weeks, myself and, and uh, the First Minister met with the, the Royal College of Nurses, um, with the Health Minister, and it was expressed in the strongest possible um, terms, in terms of the, the depth of feeling, the anxiety, the exhaustion, um, just the general feeling of, of uh, not of, of well-being and, and among the nursing staff, so um, I'd be really concerned about that. So I think we have a big job of work to do um, in terms of trying to support people in a post uh, post-COVID recovery um, era. Trevor Clark. Speaker, um, the first questioner talked about the effects that it's having on families, right down to unemployment. The last speaker talks about furlough, but I suppose the thing that's 
directly involved in both of those is actually the businesses. If we can get the businesses open again, unemployment will reduce and the furlough will end. So in terms of that strategy, has, have you used any plans to speed that up to actually prevent both unemployment and furlough to, get, to actually let those businesses get back to operating as normal, where we see a rate across the rest of the UK? The reality of the pandemic is that it's caused um, untold damage, damage you know, both from a personal point of view to people's lives and livelihoods, people's mental health and wellbeing, uh, the damage to the economy, to the small businesses, to the businesses that have been closed for the best part of a year. Whenever you take, the, the, the pandemic has been cruel and it's been unforgiving in terms of its impact. So there's a huge amount of work to do. I can assure every business um, that we want to have their doors opened as quickly as possible. We must do so safely and sustainably. If you even look towards other parts of um, Europe over the weekend where people are going back into restrictions, we want to avoid that. We don't want to be in that position. So the best way that we can avoid that, or at least attempt to avoid that, is actually by going forward steady as you go. Gradual easements, just keep making progress and keep adding to it. And we will um, find our way out of this sooner rather than later, but it will only be with continued public adherence and, and the public working with us. And we understand how difficult it is um, ourselves as well. So um, we will not keep restrictions in place for any longer than necessary. Call Rachel Woods. Thank you, um, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Deputy First Minister for answer so far. Um, today we have the return of many children and young people to face-to-face -face education. But last week, during the ministerial statement, the First Minister informed me that a decision on the return to the Sure Start developmental programme for two to three-year-olds has been referred to the COVID-19 task force. So, can I ask if a decision has been taken, and if not, when is that expected to happen? Well, the answer is no decision has been taken as yet, but I'm hoping that it will come to the executive, um, either probably, or probably Thursday's executive perhaps, um, will be the next opportunity. But the task force, which we've set out sort of specific dates at, at, a, at different intervals, um, the task force group, which is cross-departmental, meets every week, and it's actually looking at what are the current things that are – and I know this is one of the issues that's on their desk. Um, we want to be able to support uh, families that need that additional support. And also the other area is around you know, children and young people um, having support in the community as well, which I think is another area we should be looking at. I call John Stewart. Um, the Deputy First Minister rightly says that the pandemic has been cruel, and that can't be any more the case for our tourism and hospitality sectors, which have been massively hit by this, and some are predicting many will not be able to open on the back of it. Aside from additional financial support, which is what they need, Minister, they also need some assurances about when they will get reopened and the lead-in time. Can you tell me what conversations you've had with hospitality and um, tourism sectors about the plans to get reopened and what measures they need to be put in place ahead of that? Thank you. Thanks. And obviously, the principal um, inter, uh, or engagement, if you like, with um, the tourism and hospitality sector falls under the Department of the Economy, and I know there's an ongoing engagement there. However, also at our own uh, task force level, there's a continual engagement across the sectors, and we know that tourism, hospitality, are the two sectors that have been absolutely decimated as a result of the pandemic, um, and we need to continue to engage with them. But we want to be in, a, in the, the space where we're having a conversation around preparedness getting ready to open so that people know that they actually have something to work forward to or work towards. Um, so we're continuing to do that. Um, I can't remember the last time I particularly met them, but I know that I engage with hospitality also, for example, on an ongoing basis, and um, as do uh, junior ministers and the, the office of the, of the executive office. I call Pam Cameron. Thank you, Deputy First Minister, for his answers, for answers uh, so far. Could the Deputy First Minister tell us um, which phase uh, I door airsoft um, is included in is it phase two um, as a sport and leisure activity um, given that and given that that sport can take place outside at a social distance and all preparation and setup can can happen outdoors as well um, will that um, be treated as phase two and will that go ahead and are there any indicative timings or how much advance notice will be given to these types of groupings and organizations so they can resume business yeah, the plan is, is designed in such a way as that we're able to sort of say that this is what we think is coming next and we start to work with the sectors. I don't know specifically. I would have guessed that it's in the second um, cautious first steps because it's outdoor. Um, but again, I would like to clarify that with officials and I'm happy to, to write to the member. I mean, it, it makes sense outdoors safer than indoors. So obviously these are the first um, areas we'll be able to focus on and make some relaxations. So um, I'll write to the member and make sure that she's informed. I call Martina Anderson. Bill Cahar, question number four. Oh, 
We are absolutely committed to the regeneration of the North West. We want to be able to move the region forward and improve the lives of all of the people in the area. Through a sustained programme of investment and development, good progress is being made. The £250 million investment through the Derry Strabane City Deal will be really transformative. The Graduate Entry Medical School at McGee, which is on track to receive its first cohort of 70 students in September 2021, will deliver that far-reaching benefits for the regional economy and for wider society. In the Executive Office, we are taking forward a number of important projects, including the major redevelopment of Minion Square through our Urban Villages programme, a new arts and culture centre at, the, at Newgate in the Fountain, and the redevelopment of the Abrington site, which is a crucial part of our vision for the North West. We have made significant progress since the Executive Office took direct responsibility for the regeneration of the site back in April 2016. All buildings on site now have a lease agreement uh, for lease or preferred developer identified. Construction of the new Grade A office accommodation building is well underway and due to be complete in March 2022. Construction works in the proposed uh, new hotel are scheduled to commence in the summer. And a business case to develop a maritime museum on Aberdeen is being progressed by Derry City and Strabane District Council. Subject to approvals and budget, it is hoped that the Council Museum will open in 2024. A new site entrance also, a new site entrance road even, and a new service road opened in 2020 along with the provision of essential utility services which are near completion. These works have helped to attract private sector investment to the site with three new businesses opening on site in 2020 and more scheduled to open when the tenant fit out works are completed. We will continue to advance all remaining development works and progress the phased transfer of the site to the local council in due course. And we very much look forward to seeing the benefits of the regeneration to come for many years ahead. Thank the, the Minister for that answer. Minister, how advanced are the plans for the second Grade A office accommodations in Ebbington Square and Derry? As part of the plan and approval for the current Grade A office accommodation, permission has also been granted for a second office building on the same site enabling, uh, same enabling platform uh, above the underground car park. There is therefore scope for a further development of this nature should the market support it. Given the high level of interest for investment on site, following previous marketing exercises, we are making plans to, to dispose of the car park and remaining land as a, de as a development opportunity. This is expected to be via a marketing exercise in line with the well-established process uh, used for the disposals of other land and buildings on site. We are keen to bring this to the market as soon as possible, and work is already well underway in preparation. We anticipate that the development opportunity will be publicised and hopefully a formal expressions of interest sought by early April. I call Patsy McGlone. Uh, Kesh David Kuig. With your permission, can I call you a junior minister? Kearney will answer this question. Foreign policy is not a devolved matter. The function of the Bureau in China is to strengthen our relationship with central and provincial governments and the people of China to increase trade, tourism, and educational opportunities. It is not a political office, and therefore no direct representations have been made by the Bureau to the Chinese government. However, as an executive, we do have a responsibility when it comes to how we engage on the world stage and with our international partners in promoting the values and rights which are important to our democratic systems. In common with other governments, we are deeply concerned about reports of the treatment of the Uyghur and the Kazakh populations. We also believe that we are in a position to share our unique experience of how building an accountable political and democratic system is good for business and society. And that ends the period for a list of questions. <laughs> <They've run over. laughs> we will now move on. Oh, no. We will now move on to fifteen minutes of topical questions, and I call uh, Philip McGuigan. Uh, can I call you? Uh, Setsig, uh, Saren Torj, who was forty-eight from Mongolia, was stabbed and killed in Dublin in early February. Sarah Everard was kidnapped and murdered earlier this month. Uh, and at the weekend, we witnessed the very tragic deaths in Rathcool of Karen McLean and Stacey Nell. 
We all no doubt extend our deepest sympathies to their families, friends and loved ones. All these deaths have again highlighted the issue of gender-based violence against women and girls. Uh, can I ask the Joint First Minister, does she agree with me that the Executive must take immediate and resolute action to tackle the issue of gender-based violence? I thank the member um, for his question. And, and firstly, let me extend uh, my sympathies, and I'm sure the sympathies of everyone in this uh, chamber, to all those who have been bereaved in, in the most harrowing of circumstances. I think we have to always remember Cangolia at the very heart of all these uh, stories that we see breaking on the news. These are people, these are families, these are people that are loved. Uh, these women uh, who have so tragically and avoidably lost their lives, and all those families have been robbed of of their, their person. And while we appreciate that the circumstances of each um, are individual, they are also by no means isolated. And gender-based violence is appalling. Uh, it's, uh, it's the appalling truth of countless women and girls right across our society. And domestic abuse of every form is the lived, also the daily lived experience of so many women. And this comes at a time whenever domestic violence levels are, across the north are at an absolute record high. Um, we can't stand still on this issue while women and girls are continuing to come to harm, and to do so would be a dereliction of all of our duties in public office. So yes, I absolutely um, rightly agree that the executive must take a unified and determined action to tackle the critical issue of gender-based violence. It needs to be progressed in the right way um, as a matter of urgency, and I can assure the member that it will have uh, my full commitment. Supplementary, Philip McGuigan. Uh, and thank uh, the Minister for her response. And given that response and the Minister's commitment, uh, does she agree that as a society uh, we must deal with the underlying misogyny that gives rise to violence against women and girls and that th this will be best achieved through the development of an uh, executive strategy? Yeah, I, mean, I absolutely think so. I think that it's vital that the executive develops a gender specific strategy to address the many complex and issues that give rise to, to violence against women and girls. And, you are absolutely right in terms of dealing with misogyny. Um, it must be at the heart of, of all of that because there is an ingrained misogyny that, that prevails across our society and it is damaging, um, not only is it damaging to women, but it is also very dangerous. And you know, I think that we all should say very clearly that none of us should ever stand for it. Um, there is a saying in Irish, the there is no strength without unity, so we should stand together on um, this issue. Dismissing the discrimination and the denigration of women as simply outdated thinking, which is often how it is um, described. It really isn't good enough. It has to be flushed out. It needs to be eradicated in a coordinated and sustained um, approach across all parts of our society, from educating our children and our young people to adopting a zero tolerance approach towards those who would seek to abuse women and girls in this way. Can I begin by putting on record my sincere sympathies to the family of Tracy Neal, Neal and Karen McLean? who were murdered so brutally and taken from their loved ones at the weekend. Deputy First Minister, what action are you taking to make our communities a safer place for women and girls? I think just in terms of the, the previous answer, I think it's incumbent upon all of us to work together to make society a safer place and to challenge the outdated um, claims you know, that, that misog misogyny is treated nearly like it's an acceptable everyday occurrence, and that's not the case. It needs to be stamped out. It needs to be called out. Um, collectively. So I think if you're asking, there's no one solution to how you, you, you deal with this. It needs to be across all the departments. It needs to be a society approach. It needs to start at individual personal responsibility in terms of us, uh, myself even as a parent, educating my children. Um, we all have a job to do in terms of trying to make this a better place and a safe place um, for women. So um, I'm committed to playing my part in working with others to ensure that we come at this. And I think the starting point has to be the gender Based strategy around um, tackling violence against women and girls. Pod Catney, supplementary. Uh, thank you, and I hear what you say, uh, Deputy First Minister. But this is the only place on these islands without a specific strategy uh, on violence against women and girls. What is the timeline for the completion and implementation of a strategy? Uh, the, the member will hopefully also know that uh, under the remit of the Department of Justice, that Minister Long will have responsibility to bring forward such a strategy. Um, I, will continue, I will work with, with the Minister to make sure that we get a fit for purpose strategy. It is not good enough that this part of the world is the only place that does not have a strategy to tackle violence against women and girls. So Let us all uh, political parties work together to ensure that we bring forward a strategy in the most timely manner as possible. I call Rachel Woods. 
Speaker, um, the Deputy First Minister will be aware of a report recently published by the ac academics at the University of Exeter, which was funded and commissioned by the Executive, looking at the energy governments that will be required for Northern Ireland's energy transition. So, can I ask the Deputy First Minister for her assessment of one of the key recommendations from the report that a duty is placed on all Northern Ireland government departments to consider climate and energy transition as part of policy development? I thank the, the member, and obviously the outworking of such a report has to, you know, have more executive discussion. But um, I know that the issue of climate change, we all have a responsibility to play our part, and that's every department will have a responsibility. Um, I welcome the fact that the climate change bill, for example, will receive cross major or will receive a large support in the assembly chamber uh, when it comes forward. But I think the fact that we're living through a climate emergency with disastrous effects right across the board that uh, we all need to do that. So I'm very open-minded, actually, about looking at these things, but the, the details of the report I don't have with me, but very happy to write to the member in terms of where actually the report goes next and what stage it sits at. Supplementary, Rachel Woods. Thank you, um, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Deputy First Minister for her answer, and I would certainly welcome a commitment from the Executive Office um, that ha to have a duty of conducting a climate impact assessment when it comes to policy making, for example. Um, can I also ask the Deputy First Minister regarding another recommendation from the research whether she would support proposals to establish a new Department of Climate and Energy Transition, and what discussions she is having with her Executive colleagues to make that happen? Well, there aren't any conversations at, of, of that nature at this moment in time. But again, let me get the details of the report and write to the member in terms of its status, where it sits and, and where it goes to next. Um, there hasn't been any discussions uh, for some time around you know, new departments or, or um, even establishing a, an independent climate change department. But let me look at the report and, and write to the member. Call Palm Cameron. Speaker, um, what assurances can the Deputy First Minister give that the local vaccination programme will not be adversely affected by the EU's threat to ban AstraZeneca supplies to the UK? I think I, think I made a position um, clear to your party colleague earlier that access to the vaccine should be based on need. Anybody who, need, who needs to get the vaccine it should have it. It shouldn't be a commodity. It shouldn't be there to be traded. It shouldn't be used as a bargaining chip. Um, so I would encourage that everybody works together to make sure that we globally globally vaccinate all the people because what happens in this part of the world in the pandemic has an implication for what happens elsewhere and vice versa. Palm Cameron, supplementary. Thank you, Deputy First Minister. Um, will the Executive Office be supporting um, a 24-7 rollout of vaccination if the supplies do allow that within Northern Ireland in the near future? Yes, I mean, we, I think we've always said that we'll support uh, that, that position. Um, I don't think it's a position that's advanced yet by the Department of Health, but certainly um, getting the vaccine out as quickly as possible is all of our, on all, top of all of our agendas and making sure that we're protecting people. So I'm very open to supporting such a proposal. Call Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last week, Minister Mallon said the opening of a UK government office in Northern Ireland was a UK power grab and a clear attempt to undermine devolution. Can I ask, does the Deputy First Minister agree? My own personal view is that it interferes with, um, this is not an agreed executive position, of course, but yes, my own personal view is that um, what we need to do is make the institutions, the power sharing institutions work, work all strands of the Good Friday Agreement. I wholeheartedly believe in the Good Friday Agreement, and I do believe that the British Government should not be undermining that power sharing by interfering and establishing um, offices in Belfast that interferes with what are the devolved responsibilities of the ministers here. The Deputy First Minister will know full well that this is a commitment in sat in part of the new decade new approach, as was the marking of the centenary in a, and I quote, spirit of mutual respect. What respect was at the heart of the Sinn Féin decision to veto the marking of the centenary with a commemorative stone? And how can the Deputy First Minister expect unionism to honour the commitments made under New Decade New Approach when evidently you and your party are clearly cherry-picking what you like and dislike within the agreement? I think the debate over the, the stone and the, and the monument proposed um, by unionists to mark the centenary of uh, the establishment of the Northern State, I think once again all that has done is to highlight the fact that um, we need to have a continued transformation of this society. We need to create a shared society. We need to create an inclusive society. And I think it, it, underlines, for me, certainly, it underlines for me certainly the importance of uh, inclusive discussion, dialogue, the need for political discourse, 
the need for ongoing engagement. Um, and I'm sure, even, even to the member, but I'm quite sure anybody with an, with an objective uh, view of this place where I am elected to, there isn't an, it isn't an inclusive or a welcoming place for people who come from a nationalist or republican background. So what's important, what's more important, is actually that we work together towards the future. Yes, we reflect on the past, but someone of your generation, of your age category, should be more concerned about working towards building a better future. I encourage you to work with me. Let's make this place a more inclusive society. Let's do all that we can to make sure that it's welcoming. Let's make sure that young people of today don't fight the battles of the past. So I would encourage people to continue to look forward, to look about sharing this place, to look about how we can live and demonstrate by, our mutual, by mutual respect, by generosity of spirit, by making sure with good grace. Order, order members. With, with, members, with, order, please. So I think people should realise that there's nothing to be feared from the future. There's something for us all to work for, something better, something better where previous generations have been failed. So my final word to the member is work with me and let's make this a more inclusive place where we all live comfortably together, side by side. I call Harry Harvey. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Deputy First Minister, could you please enlighten the House on when you plan and think it's safe to reopen static caravan parks and holiday homes, St Patrick's Day being passed and Easter coming fast? Thank you. The member is a poet and he didn't know it. <laughs> I think the issue of caravans actually has been raised quite a lot of recent, but I think because the weather is turning again and people are very much looking towards being able to get back onto their caravan sites. I know that this is an issue that has been raised certainly with, the, uh, with Minister Dodds in terms of responsibility for um, caravan parks. Um, I think it's too early for us to say at this stage when that's going to be, but certainly, as we've always said, we won't keep restrictions in place for any longer than necessary. In relation to static um, caravans, there are already some categories when people are obviously able to uh, go to their, their caravan. Um, but I think that uh, in terms of what date uh, we would look at being able to move those restrictions, I couldn't give you that, that date today. The only thing I can say is that uh, we will continue to work our way through these issues, and as soon as we think it's safe, we will um, announce that. Supplementary, Harry Harvey. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank you for your answers, Deputy First Minister. Have you given any consideration to touring caravans as well, risk assessment maybe to shared facilities on the sites and stuff? Is that something you have given consideration? Thank you. Um, I, I think that the, 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 I suppose it's all in the mix. It will all be part of the caravan um, conversation. So um, I will, as part of our ongoing deliberations, I will um, ensure that the, the points that you have raised are factored into the conversation. Call Sinead Ennis. Can the Joint First Minister advise what discussions have been had with the British Secretary of State on funding for the uh, Victims, Victims Payment Scheme? Uh, thanks again to the, to the member for um, the question. I think it's really important that we continue to work our way through this. I think it's really important that uh, the victims and survivors uh, hear that the executive are committed to this scheme and that we're determined to get that money paid. However, the advances that have been made from uh, the Secretary of State in the last week aren't sufficient uh, in order to allow us to move forward in terms of uh, the financial commitment that we need to develop the scheme. So we haven't asked for another meeting, cross-departmental meeting, because obviously it, in it in uh, includes TEO, finance and justice working together. So um, we are still um, asking for that meeting and we need to have it as soon as possible in order to be able to uh, progress this issue. Um, members, the time is up. And can members please take a for a moment or two? Do we set the table for the next item? Not your question time. Unfortunately, we have to take it later on. Thank you.